to our worship team. And uh, it's great. They draw us near to God in a great way. And it has been an amazing service uh, already. And it is just great to be together. I feel like uh, God is moving powerfully in the church here in the last few weeks. And I pray that he continues to. But as we get started, why don't we go to him in prayer? Uh, Father, I thank you for this time. Thank you for the service so far. Thank you that you filled us up. I pray that we can live out the words of that song, God, that we won't give our heart to another, but we'll give it to you wholeheartedly. Uh, be with the next few minutes as we look into your word, that you can inspire us, that you can stir our hearts, that you can help us to see you in a greater way and to uh, be moved to respond uh, by your spirit. God, take me out of the way and use me in a powerful way. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey Amen. Well, it's been a great week, as you've heard already here. This was the, uh, the still shot on the video. And uh, what an amazing time uh, for the Serrano family. And uh, it's good to, those, those mountaintop times, uh, they're not every day, but they are memorable. And there's something that we got to hold on to, and I'm sure they'll never forget uh, in a great way. I'm excited to see what God's going to do uh, with Jacob. And uh, he's really made a big impact on my life, too. Uh, as well as us impacting him. He's definitely impacted us in a great way. I'll never forget when we were studying a few weeks ago, and he was, we were talking about how hard it's going to be, because that's one of the things that teens have a hard time with, right? It's, it's pretty hard to be a disciple, and that's something that you figure out when your parents are disciples. You go, man, this is not just like 7-Eleven Christianity. I mean, this is 24-7, 365, every area of your life. And so in a good way, our kids kind of grow up going, man, I'm not so sure about this. Uh, this is a big commitment, and that's a good thing. You want them to get that. And we were talking about that, and I remember Jacob, he just was sharing, and he says, you know it's hard, but everything in life is hard, and it's so worth it. And I just kind of stepped back, and I felt like for a second I was talking to his dad, <laughs> And I'm like, wow, this kid's 15 years old, and he has that perspective on life. He's seen God move in his family, as we've shared about his parents' uh, marriage being rescued and then being saved about four years ago. And so seeing that transformation and seeing his faith is a powerful thing. So teens, you can do it. Yeah. It's hard, but everything in life is hard. But it's worth it. That's the key part. And so the title today is, I Have Overcome the World. And I love this famous saying of Jesus, but I, I love this picture that she's just swinging over the city like a kid. You know, and when we have faith in God, we, we get to soar for him. We get to be kids again, spiritually. We get to be what God created us to be, and I believe that is the term for the Christian life. I have overcome the world. If your view of Christianity is something different, then you're not following Jesus. Because at the end of his resume was, rise from the dead. At the end of every disciple's resume is going to be whatever you did in your life, and at the end, you rose from the dead and went to be with Jesus. So wherever you're at, if you're a disciple, you are an overcomer. And I pray that today that you see your Christian life in that way again, because that's the way Jesus lived every day. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. You know, at this point, he really hadn't. Death was not destroyed yet. He had not risen from the dead yet, but he knew this is where I'm going. And if you think about a more depressing dinner, the Last Supper was that. Nobody left there feeling like, man, that was just a bonding time with Jesus. Because the next, that same night, he was arrested. And by the time the sun went down the next day, he was dead. And on the third day, when they saw that sun come up and they saw Jesus, they understood he really did overcame. That is, the, the, that is who we're following. And he said that he told them those things so that they would have peace. My point number one is this world is full of trouble. 
That's what he said, right? This world is full of trouble. I love that because in saying this world, he's implying that there's another world that's not full of trouble, but this world is full of trouble. I don't know if your trouble looks like the kid on the right. We had a kid fall in the full pool today in the middle of the baptism sharing. I mean, that was, maybe that was you. Or maybe you're trying to get to work or trying to get your kid to daycare and your car breaks down and that's you on the left. And I don't know why you would put your kid on the roof, but that could be some more trouble if they would fall off there. I don't know what your week was like, but I know that you were in this world and you had some trouble come your way. You know, in our family on Friday night, we had some trouble. It was called a flag football game. And there was trouble. And at the end of the game, they called a pass interference call at the end, and the ref that called it was about 50 yards away from it. And we even knew him, and we lost the game by one foot because of that 10-yard penalty we lost by one foot. And man, there was some trouble. There was yelling going on. There was, you know, obscenities. There was, it, not from our family, but I mean, it was crazy out there. And, you know, I was proud of Connor, and one other boy went up and shook the ref's hand. And I said, wow, that's better than me <laughs> at that point, because I'm full of trouble right now. And the two assistant refs came up to the, the head rep and said, hey, that ball was uncatchable, so it shouldn't be a penalty, but he didn't care, he kept it. And he even told me that they told him that it was uncatchable, and so that was, that was some trouble. <laughs> we, I, and that was something that we, we didn't even really care, but it was a problem, right, in our day. It was, you know, it, it dominated the rest of our evening in some ways. So I don't know what it was for you. Maybe your sin this week was your trouble. Maybe decisions that you made brought trouble on you in the form of guilt, in the form of issues with other people, in the form of blocking your way to God. I don't know. Maybe you brought trouble on yourself. Something happened and you just started playing those negative tapes that we all have and just telling yourself how much of a loser you are and how you did that again and how you're never going to stop doing that. And I don't know, sometimes we can bring trouble on ourselves. Maybe it came in the form of your spouse. They can bring some trouble too, can't they? I know I can bring trouble. You can ask my family. Man, it got nice and quiet in here on that one. That's true. <laughs> For those of you who aren't married, and we talk about the blessings of marriage, but man, it is not easy to be married because we bring trouble on each other. Not only do we have our own trouble, but we get to share someone else's trouble. And someone else who doesn't think the way we think, we get to share their trouble and their way of getting out of trouble, which is not a good way because anyway. <laughs> Maybe your trouble came in the form of gossip and people talking about you. And just the frustration that comes because you can never defend yourself in gossip, can you? It never works. Maybe you were tested. Maybe your friends, maybe it was your boss. Maybe it was expectations that you couldn't, couldn't reach. Maybe you're living life just in a disappointed state because your life didn't turn out the way you wanted it to be. I don't know what trouble came in you this week, but I know that you had some form of trouble. And turn over to Psalm 41 because David is writing and he has trouble on every side. He said, blessed are those who have regard for the weak. The Lord delivers them in times of trouble. See, they're even there. The Lord protects and preserves them. They are counted among the blessed in the land. He does not give them over to the desire of their foes. The Lord sustains them on their sickbed and restores them from their bed of illness. So here in three verses, he's got five different kinds of trouble. He's got weak people that he's trying to help. He's got just general trouble. He's got foes that have evil desires towards him. He's got sick, and he's sick and ill and on his sick bed. And so I'm not sure what trouble came your way this week, but... That's a lot of trouble to come in one week. That's a lot of, of, of issues and problems. 
You know, sometimes we think to ourselves that, man, isn't it going to be great when I don't have any more problems? That's faulty reason. That's not going to happen until you get to heaven. That's not the issue that David was talking about. And when I look at the same verses, look what you see here. Blessed are those who have regard for the weak. The Lord delivers them in times of trouble. The Lord protects and preserves them. They are counted among the blessed. He does not give them over to the desires of their foes. The Lord sustains them on their sickbed and restores them from their bed of illness. Same verses from our perspective and from God's perspective. Amen. You know, trouble is out there, but God is out there too. And a lot of times it's determined by what we choose to focus on. Do we see the trouble or do we see God sustaining me through the trouble? Do we see people that hate me or do we see God who loves me? Do we, over, do we have that overcomer, faithful spirit? Or do, are we getting up in our day and we're looking for trouble? I don't think any of us sit in our mind and go, okay, I'm going to look for trouble today. I'm going to look for all the bad things that happen. What a terrible philosophy. We're going to have a seminar and it's going to be, see, find all the trouble you can in your life. Be as miserable as possible. And yet sometimes we can live that way and we miss all the blessings that are right in front of us. You know, David says that I have sinned against you. Sin was part of his trouble. If we are sinning on a constant basis, unrepentant sin will kill us. He said he had enemies, slander, spreading it all around. When people came to see him, they, they just gathered slander so they could spread it around. That was what he lived with every day. They talked behind his back. In verse 9, it refers to David, but also prophecy about Jesus. Even my close friend, someone I trusted, has turned against me. I mean betrayal. We've all gone through this in different ways. You know, why? Why does this happen? You ever think about, why, why is this all happening to me? That's a bad question. That's what gets us into trouble right there. Why is it happening to you? Because you're in the world. Because the world is lost. Because you're, whoever is your enemy is a sinner. And they don't want to make the Bible their standard. Because you're in the world. I mean, Jesus said those words, and then he went to the cross. Talk about why. That wasn't the question. The question is, where do you turn in your trouble? That's the question that Jesus was talking about. In Psalm 42, one of my favorite psalms here, it says, As the deer pants for streams of water... So my soul pants for you, oh my God. My soul thirsts for God, the living God. When can I go and meet with my God? My tears have been my food day and night while people saying to me all day long, where is your God? You know, I've always looked at this as a super inspirational psalm about just wanting to be closer to God and just desiring to have time with Him. And I'm convicted even just reading it. Because you get that flavor that they just can't get enough. They just have to have more. You know, the person that wrote this, it's between Psalm 41 and 42, it shifts gears from David's psalms to a different book. And this was written by the descendants of Korah. I don't know if you remember that name, but it's pretty significant. Number 16, those were the ones that opposed Moses and said, who are, the, who are Aaron's descendants to be able to worship before me? I mean, we're just as good as they are. We should be able to do that too. And remember, the earth opened up and swallowed them all down because they were opposing God's leaders. That wasn't really a good day for that family. But these were the people that survived. The Kor Korahites, they continued to worship God after all their relatives got taken away like that. 
And they continued to follow God in times of trouble. And this was actually written when they were in captivity thousand miles away from Jerusalem. He was writing this, basically saying, I wish I could go back and worship in Jerusalem where God is. But I can't get there. Maybe it's more like us when we miss our quiet times. When we're like, oh man, I'm just, I'm dying here without God. I'm, I'm fading away. No, that was his desire. You know, where do you turn in times of trouble? Do we turn to ourself? Do we turn to our own solution? Do we work harder? Do we call a friend? Do we use a lifeline? Yeah, I was looking for that word. Or do we turn to God? Or do we pour out our hearts to him? You know, I was so, I was really encouraged by Gabe today. He came over to my house uh, as I was printing out some things. He went in the, I was kind of lost him for a while. And he went in the backyard and he was just praying for 10 minutes. He just had 10 minutes, so he just went outside to pray. As I was thinking about this sermon, I was like, wow, that's, that's the heart. I got 10 minutes. Let me go spend time with God. I got time. Let me be with God. I need more time. You know, so many times we end our quiet times not because we're finished praying, but because we're out of time. I don't know how many times that happens to me when I still have so many other things on my heart, but it's just time to go. And I don't tend to go back to that. And so I'm just walking around with all this stuff that I'm carrying on my own, that I have not given over to God. You know, in the last few weeks, we've been talking a lot about sharing our faith in the church and reaching out and being a light in the world, haven't we? You know, it's been... Very encouraging and very revealing at the same time. You know, I also started asking another question. All right, if I'm going to go out and be sharing my faith and giving my light to the world, how much light do I actually have? How much time am I spending with God? How much time am I praying to God? And about four weeks ago, it was probably about 30 to 35 minutes. You know, I had really no idea. I didn't know how much it was. I just prayed till I had to go. Just being quite honest with you, probably like a lot of us. We read the Bible and we pray until that magic hour hits and then we, we're done. And so I started keeping track of how, how long am I praying each day because I really had no idea. It was kind of the Dave Ramsey principle with prayer. I'm not sure where my money's going, so let me figure it out. Let me do the same thing. You know, and the... It was. It was about 35 minutes. And each week, you know, now it's about 54 minutes. And I still feel like, man, I feel so much lighter, but I still feel like I need more. You know, and there's some days when it's like 10 minutes. So you might go, wow, 54, that sounds great. No, some days maybe it's 10 or 15 minutes. And on those days, man, I struggle. I feel like I'm just struggling. I'm, I'm fighting against the day. Instead of fighting with the day, I'm fighting against the day. You know, so my challenge to all of you is to pray more. Pray more. God's the one that wants to move, so pray more. These kind only come out by prayer and fasting. So if you have trouble in your life, pray more. If you're not satisfied after your quiet time in the morning, pray more. I don't know what that means for you. Maybe that's a 10 minutes on your lunch break. Maybe that's praying on the way to work. Maybe that's at the end of the day. Maybe it's praying through a psalm. I don't know how that works for you. You know, I, I pray when I run. So I go run and I pray. And it's just so encouraging. So whatever, maybe that doesn't work for you. But whatever works for you, my challenge is pray more. At the end of your life, you'll never regret that I prayed too much. I spent too much time with God. You know, and let's talk about sharing too, as we're on the topic. That's kind of what started it. You know, about a month ago, I'd say if I was sharing my faith, it would be somewhere less than 10 people a week. Again, I had no idea how many people I was sharing with. Because it wasn't on the front of my mind. It wasn't that I was against it. It's just that I wasn't doing it. 
I go into the store and I come out. Nothing. I go to the bank, come out. Go to the practice, come back. Yeah, every once in a while. But it's so encouraging to feel like, man, I have a purpose again. Everywhere I go, it doesn't take you a second more time to share your faith. It just takes your focus and your thought and your, your faith that God wants to use you even in the time that you have. It's been so encouraging studying with Connor's friend's dad. He studies it from 6 to 7 a.m. And at 7, he's got to go. I, that was a pretty open time in my schedule. So it, it didn't take any extra time. It just took showing up at 6 o'clock. You know, sometimes we're so limited and that we, we don't look for God to move. We don't look for solutions. You know, now I'm averaging, I average about 21 people the last four weeks, a, a week. And that might not do it for you. I don't, I, I don't care. I'm not counting. I'm not like flogging myself if I miss a day. I'm just saying there's a difference between being a, about your purpose and not. And as a church, it, not everybody, but a month ago, I'd say that we were not in general. So share more. Pray more and share more. In trouble. God, if you're going to wait till you're out of trouble to make a difference in somebody's life, you're never going to do it. God wants to use us in the midst of our trouble to help other people. I love this story. They're in the boat and Jesus is asleep. They got trouble coming all around and Jesus is not worried about it. And he wakes up and he calms the storm and then he rebukes them for their lack of faith. I got this. I overcame the world. Your problems, I, they're not too big for God. He may, may feel like he's sleeping, but he's there. This world, you will have trouble. Point number two, I have overcome the world. That's a picture uh, of t Egypt here. I think it's the parliament building on the right, and on the left is a, a church in the, on the right side and a mosque steeple on the left. You know, we're going to hear from Mafid next week and Jesse coming to church and just talking about overcoming the Islam faith and the just shining Jesus in the world. And that's what he has to deal with. He walks down the street and you see a mosque and a temple everywhere you go. And, and the Christians are outnumbered. And yet Jesus' response is, I have overcome the world. It's not a big thing for me. I'm the only one that rose from the dead, remember? That's what he says in his eyes. But that was what he lived, and I love this. In verse 44, 40, chapter 44, it says, We have heard with our ears, O God, our ancestors told us what you did in their days, in days long ago. With your hand you drove out the nations and planted our ancestors. You crushed the peoples and made our ancestors flourish. It was not by their sword that they won the land, nor did their arm bring them victory. It was your right hand, your arm, and the light of your face, for you loved them. And I love this passage because it's not about them. It's about God. He says, with your hand you drove out the nations. It wasn't because they were so great that they conquered and did all these great things. It was because of God. It's not because you're such an awesome Christian that God's going to use you. It's because you're His. It's because you're the only thing He can use. He's got no other choice. He's used us or nobody. Okay, I'll choose them. It's like the last person picked. But God will use us because it's not about him, it's about how much he loves us. Right. To use a business term, we're not selling ourselves. We're selling God's grace. We're selling something, we're sharing something that can take away all your sins and all your trouble and help you overcome this life. We're selling, the, we're sharing, I keep saying selling. 
We're sharing the only thing that you really need. That's amazing. He kept going. He says, you are my king and my God who decrees victories for Jacob. Not Jacob Serrano, but Jacob, the tribe of Jacob. <laughs> though, though you were put... Through you, we push back our enemies. Through your name, we trample our foes. I put no trust in my bow. My sword does not bring me victory. But you give us victory over our enemies. You put adversaries to shame. In God, we make our boast all day long. In God, we, and, you, and we will praise your name forever. That God gives us the victory. And one thing that we used to do a lot more of is boasting in the Lord. Boasting in God, that God is better than the world. That my life as a Christian is 50,000 times better than any day I ever had in the world. Amen. That the life that you have, your worst day, is better than the best day in the world. That if you can go to heaven, whatever you go through in this life, you won't even care. And yet, so many times, we can't share that. Because we're not connected to that, because we're not holding on to that. I know you believe that, but are you living that? Is that the spirit in which you live? That was the spirit which Jesus walked the earth, that whatever happens, God is going to use me, and if you're against him, you're going down. In every situation, and I've been so convicted by this, and I love what Steph said at the baptism today, I'd rather be living for God judged by the world than living for the world judged by God. I said, man, that's it. My challenge for all of us is which hill are you going to take for God? What is God going to put on your heart? What is he going to use you to do? What are you going to boast about because it wasn't you, but it was God? You don't get to boast if you just show up for church and family group. Anybody can do that. But you, if you got to put yourself out there. You got to step out in faith again and rely on God and allow him to make it a reality. I feel like, and I speak to myself as well, that when God looks at our lives, he's bored. I think he's bored. Man, I want to do something. And you're just kind of like, will you do something, please? Will you get to stir yourself up? Step out. Do something great. You know, since it's baseball season, I don't know if we have any baseball fans in here. I know Jacob likes baseball, so this one's for you there, buddy. I was watching the movie Moneyball. It's a great movie because it ends up encouraging Boston. That's why I like it. But he's talking with David Justice, who's 30 years, 37 years old. His best years are behind him. Played for the Braves, Yankees. Now he's with the A's. And he's still trying to be who he once was. And the general manager says, you know, David, we didn't get you for the player you used to be. We got you for the player you are right now. You know, God doesn't have us for who we used to be. He doesn't want to use us because of that guy. He wants to use us for who you are right now. For the situation that you're in. He's not worried about the past. He's got you in a spot where you can be used. And I'm going to close out with the verse 35, uh, chapter 45, the first verse. He says, My heart is stirred by a noble theme. As I recite my verses for the king, my tongue is the pen of a skillful writer. You are the most excellent of men, and your lips have been anointed with grace since God has blessed you forever. 
Gird your sword on your side, you mighty one. Clothe yourself with splendor and majesty. In your majesty, ride victoriously in the cause of truth, humility, and justice. Let your right hand achieve awesome deeds. You know, I don't know what to think about things sometimes. I had a dream last night, and you know, you get those dreams and you go, well, I don't know what that was. Whatever it was, I had a dream that 18 people got baptized in the Desert Cities Church. I don't know if it was in a day, if it was in a week, I, I don't know all that. But I remember just feeling like, wow, this is what we signed up for. This is amazing. This is beyond us. This is God. You know, I pray that your heart is stirred by a noble theme today. I believe God wants to call out the best parts of all of us. The part that wants to be with him. The part that wants to make a difference. The part that understands that we're forgiven. The part that wants to be used. The part that said the words, many of you, Jesus is Lord. As we heard this week. And for so many of us, if we had it to do all over again, we'd do it again. Jesus is Lord. And God wants to, us to stir our hearts. When was, when we're stirred, God uses us. We're inspired. We're determined. We're motivated by the right things. We're amazed by Jesus. When we're stirred, nothing can stop us. Some of us have not been stirred by a noble theme, maybe ever. Some of you have never realized what God has given you and the purpose that he has for your life. Now's the time to be stirred. Even today, you've probably been stirred. But it's time to listen to that. And there's so many of us that maybe we haven't been stirred in a long time. When we talk about when we were stirred, we got to go back years. My prayer for you and my challenge is to pray that you will be stirred again. That you'll dream again. That you won't settle. That you won't be depressed. That you won't be discouraged. That you won't look back in time. But you'll look ahead. Because most of us are not even halfway done. God wants to stir us up over and over and over again. I pray that today that you see the trouble in the world. But in a bigger way, you see that we can overcome with Jesus. Thank you.